much. We're going to go ahead and get started here today. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Chris Myers. I'm the Managing Director of the Capitol Hill Campus Program. Uh, this is the first of our inaugural 111th Congress of Events. Thank you for joining us today. We have some new faces uh, as well as some old faces here today. Um, just a quick program note. Uh, with the Mercatus Center's uh, Capitol Campus Program that's here is bridge the gap between academic uh, study and uh, academics scholarly environment with policymakers. Uh, often uh, you guys are trying to seek out the right information and uh, all models to bring that information from an academic perspective to you so that you can better analyze policy and make better decisions. Um, and uh, this is definitely one of our most popular programs we do during the year, we do four of them. Uh, and uh, definitely it's uh, more timely now than it has been in a few years. Uh, no doubt, the uh, state of the economy is definitely something that you guys are going to be dealing with. Uh, probably for a few years to come now. So uh, we uh, thank you for joining us. Just a uh, quick uh, also note that uh, in front of you, you should have plans for the upcoming events we have for uh, the rest of the month. Uh, we're going to be doing tonight a, a, a cocktail reception at the Monocle on the Senate side. Uh, if you guys would love to join us, please do so. Go on the website. Uh, I think it's funny. You send me an email, cmyers2 at gmu.edu. Uh, and, uh, we'd love to have you join us uh, this evening. It's going to be from uh, 6.30 to 8, uh, 6.30 to uh, uh, 6 to 7.30. Uh, and Dr. Daniel will be there too if you'd like to uh, get some more questions at him uh, after the event concludes today. Also, uh, tomorrow we have our second panel that we're doing with our financial markets working group. Uh, it, uh, it's going to be exploring a lot of important issues. Dr. Daniel is once again going to be joining us. He's definitely a figure this week uh, with us. Uh, he's going to be just discussing some of the public choice issues uh, that uh, intersect between industry uh, and uh, uh, public policy when government uh, decision makers have to make decisions on regulating industry. We're also going to have Todd Zawicki do a uh, talk on bankruptcy. Uh, and uh, we're also going to have a conversation on government ownership uh, and uh, uh, shareholders' rights and the relationships that exist there now, especially with uh, large government ownership uh, in a lot of the uh, uh, banks today. Uh, also, we've got on uh, uh, Thursday, our final program is dealing with uh, economic development. We have a program, the Global Prosperity Initiative, uh, which looks to understand economic development, both from a domestic and international standpoint, uh, the lessons that uh, we've been able to learn from that perspective. Uh, so we're going to be bringing that to you uh, with two of our best scholars on that subject. Uh, and the next week, uh, after the inauguration, I think we're going to be bringing in uh, Roy Myers from the University of Baltimore, and he's going to be discussing the budget process uh, and uh, the kind of things that people have been talking about the last couple of years uh, in analyzing how the budget process goes. Uh, so, uh, sorry about that, I just want to get that out of the way. Also, if you see those yellow uh, forms, uh, if you can fill those out uh, while you're listening uh, to Dr. Yangle's talk, it helps us to better uh, keep track of how we're doing and how it's performing and try to bring you the best information. Uh, just uh, let me introduce real quick Dr. Yangle. Uh, he is a um, uh, he's an emeritus professor uh, and the DBT scholar at the University of Clemson, uh, as well as being affiliated uh, as an adjunct professor of economics with the Data Center's Capital Campus Program. Uh, he has a lot of experience in academia and in government, actually, because from 76 to 78, I think he was a senior economist with the staff of the President's Council on Wage and Price Stability. Uh, and from 1982 to 84, he's also executive director of the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, he does these programs four times a year, so we're glad that you can join us when he does do that. But uh, you can join me now. Thank you very much. We're delighted to be with you to uh, continue a conversation about the economy. The, uh, if anyone ever wished to be living in momentous times, uh, if anyone in this group made that wish, we got our wish. Uh, that is what is going on, in, at least in your lifetime and mine, in a, in a pretty uh, absolute sense, is unparalleled. We can, we can find pieces of history that match some of the pieces of the current period, but uh, we're engaged in, uh, we're in deep water in terms of policy development. And I think it's important for us to always remember that as policy decisions are made, sometimes in the heat of what appears to be crisis, we are defining the economy of the future. So we, are, we are making decisions that lay a foundation or give a direction to what the economy will be some years from now. It was pointed out in the uh, editorial pages of the New York Times Sunday 
that one of the major challenges we face today is dealing with Social Security and, and trying to make that program well and strong. And the writer pointed out that this is something that came out of that Great Depression. It was a major decision that was made, and in a sense, we're still grappling with it and, and, and how to get it turned in a better direction than it is pointed right now. So decisions we make that aren't, and, that, and that have already been made uh, will give something for a future generation to grapple with uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago. In that sense, what we're talking about is critically important. Uh, the picture is just to set the mood here, and I think I pointed out to the group in October when we were talking that I have a personal interest in that uh, Great Depression because I was a contributor to it. Uh, I was born in 1933, and my mother always told me that anyone born in 1933 was not planned, but they surely were loved. <laughs> and uh, so I got a lot, a lot of love in my family. I think it was my sister that really caused the thing. She was born in 29. But, but we do have these memories, and we know something about the past, and we know something about scenes that we don't want to see repeated. And that's one of them that we have in the background of that slide. So as we talk today, uh, let's talk about the recession, depression. What have we got? That is, what is this uh, economic slump, recession, what kind of animal is this we're dealing with as we attempt to describe it and the forces that it brings to us. And then how long will it be, in addition to how deep will it be, when might we see a light, we might say, at the end of the tunnel, when will the economic sun come out from behind the clouds? And then what about some of the remedies and what do they bring? What about the stimulus and what does it bring? Dot told me as I was preparing this presentation the other night, she said, but when you get to Washington, please give those good people some good news. <laughs> and I have to really scratch, uh, but there is some good news. And so let's start off with the good news. Because even though our unemployment rate now slightly exceeds 7%, that says that 93% in this, of the people in this country who want a job have one. There are few places in the world where you can make a statement. We're running at 93%. Now, we'd like to be running at 95% or at 96%. But the difference between where we are now and where we are, you might say, in the best of times is two or three percentage points. But the difference, that gap hurts. It hurts. But let's celebrate the fact that we have 93% of the people seeking to be employed in this country. That number is going to get smaller as we go forward. That is, those who want to be employed, that number is going to get smaller. Indeed, uh, it could well be that by the time the summer rolls around, we'll be able to say 90% of the people in this country who are seeking employment have employment. That's what the forecast looks like at the moment. Now, in terms of stimulus, one of the largest stimuli that we have received as consumers turns out to be in our billfolds and in the tanks of our automobiles, but the sharp decline in the price of petroleum and gasoline is the equivalent of a $200 billion annual stimulus that consumers have already received. It did not take an act of Congress to get it to us. We got some other stimuli that way, but this one came through the market as prices of energy were changing. Then the lower mortgage rates that are potentially available to people who own a home and are able to make payments on their mortgage. Given the sharp decline in mortgage interest rates, let's take the 30-year plain vanilla fixed rate mortgage uh, rate, which was at six and a half and six and three quarter. It's now headed toward four. It's in the low fives right now. That differential is large enough for it to make a lot of sense for a family to refinance their mortgage. The equivalent value of that has a potential of being worth $800 billion in gain for American consumers this year. That is a huge stimulus that is out there. So market forces are bringing us some things. And then the other item of good news, and we'll look at a little bit of evidence on this one, is that finally, 
when we look at some indicators, credit markets which were locked up, literally locked up, not functioning, are beginning to work not quite as well as they were, but they're beginning to work again. So some of the actions that have taken place and then the passage of time and market forces is delivering something of a remedy to us. A deep, deep question that we may talk about tomorrow and I'll be happy to brush up against it today is how did it happen that what was a serious overconstruction and investment in housing in the United States and what got to be called the subprime problem, how did that become a major collapse of the industrial world? How on earth did that happen? And when we ask the question, we know it happened suddenly. So what about the next two years? Let's start off looking at, at what some of the soothsayers are saying for the next two years. And I'm showing you some forecasts here, and I have them ordered chronologically so that you can see what has happened. At the very top of the chart are some forecasts by reputable groups, people with reputations, from September. And so you can see what the better forecasters were thinking about the world in September as they made a forecast for the year that has just ended, 2008, and looked forward to 2009. And so in September, we did not have a world recession on our hands. We had a subprime crisis on our hands, and there was some feeling that it was going to be contained, and so what we were going to have was very subnormal, positive growth. Then as October rolled around, and then you get to November. Notice as you look at the 2009 forecasts, by November, those forecasts become zero or negative. And then as you get to December, zero or negative for the year ahead. And so in a relatively brief time, based on the evidence that was coming in, forecasters began to become decidedly pessimistic as they looked ahead. Now this is through December. My guess is that as we get January's forecast in and February's forecast, they will not become any brighter and may not become much more negative. But we have a negative outcome that we're staring at as we think about those forecasts. Uh, this is sort of the way it looks when we put it in a bar chart. Uh, we're looking here at real growth in GDP uh, the purple bars represent data that has not arrived, and so that represents an estimate. Uh, one of those bars is painted an odd color, and that's to point out that that's the bar that was affected by the tax refunds, the refunds that went out back in the summer, so that we got what could be called an artificial stimulus of GDP, and notice that it went away. But it was a one-time shot of an increase in GDP, and then it goes away when the money went away. And now we're down below zero. Uh, most likely that second bar, I'm speaking of the second one, in terms of data yet to come, this one will probably be even deeper negative than shown in the chart. But it does give you a profile. The profile suggests that by the time we get to 2010, mid-year, uh, we will begin to feel a pulse beat that is fair, but not good. We won't be on the yellow brick road, but uh, it will be a positive growth pulse beat that we will begin to feel as we get to 2010. And so now we're living with this, wondering in a sense, what does this trough look like? How deep is the bottom? And a little more precise, how long will it last? As we think about remedies, and as you consider stimulus packages and so forth, and TARP extension, the big numbers, we almost get immune to them. We talk about hundreds of billions and then trillions, and then we read really well-established economists with extraordinary credentials saying it can't be big enough to get In other words, it's unlimited. Just call out the biggest number you've ever thought of, and that economist would say, that's not enough. The, the unfortunate aspect of that is that somebody's got to pay for it. If that stimulus has any value, 
in terms of real purchasing power, is going to be paid for. Now, what I'm showing you here is one way that we in our community call the United States of America, one way that we pay for things. We pay for them with our savings. And so what I'm showing you here is the personal savings rate. The data start back in 1960. And if you know, and as you look at it, the personal savings rate was about uh, up at almost 10% right in here. When we get down in here, it's zero, practically speaking. That's the fund that was left over after you paid all the bills and you sat at the kitchen table and you say, how are we doing this year, honey? You say, well, it's been pretty tough and we're not able to put much money to one side. But there's a good crisis brewing out there, and somebody wants us to pay it off. And you say, with what? The only way we can pay it off is with our future savings. So we better get serious about saving some money and putting it away. And I've drawn a circle around the recent data, and as you look at it, you say, wow, America, if you can see that, there has been a sharp increase in savings. A sharp increase in savings in the United States. But, but let me put some dimensions on those numbers. In 2007, the most recent data we have for a year, the total savings of the entire United States community was $57 billion. That's what it was, $57 <coughs> billion. And so if we're going to spend $500 billion to get ourselves going again, this is an oversimplification, but it is still a way to think about it. That says, wow, that would take 10 years of future savings to pay that thing off, wouldn't it? Can you think of anybody else that will pay it off for us? Well, not really. There's not that much altruism in the world, I don't believe. And most of the other folks are suffering, too. Now, we can think of some people who will lend it to us. Because that's what we will be doing. We will be borrowing from the rest of the world to take care of these crises. And as we think about borrowing from the rest of the world, then we still get back to the problem, what will be the basis for paying it off? And one basis will be coming out of savings. Now, of course, now let's look at the unhappy aspect to some people's way of thinking. The unhappy aspect associated with this increase in savings is what? What's the unhappy aspect associated with that? They're not spending and so we have presidents and others saying, America, please get out there and spend. Why? Because we've got to get the economy going again. And what did the American people do? Just the reverse. Just the reverse. They didn't increase their spending. Why do you suppose they increased their savings? And it probably wasn't people sitting around the table saying, we've got to figure out a way to pay off the deficit. I kind of doubt that was in the conversation that night as they sat at the kitchen table. Why do you think they increase their savings so dramatically? All right, they can't borrow anymore. They've been turned out for loans and they're trouble with their credit cards, maybe. But what's another? What's another part of the mix that goes into the decision that says we got to, we've got to put some money in the old savings account or somewhere? Fear. 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 All right, unemployment is going up. Your next door neighbor has lost her job. Uh, you're hearing about bank closings, and in addition to that, you have testimony taking place in some of the most important places in the world, and what are the people saying in the room? The world's coming to an end. The economic world is going to come to an end if we do not stimulate this economy. And then, in some people's minds, as people begin to try to identify what was the watershed point, I noticed that Mark Zandi at economy.com this morning as I was reading his page, they're a pretty powerful outfit. He has identified the bankruptcy of Jenny May and Fannie Mae, the nationalization of those two organizations as the event that sent the powerful signal to the world that says we are in a heap of trouble. Now, those two organizations were nationalized for, because they were viewed to be bankrupt, but they were bankrupt because of an accounting rule, not because of cash flow. They were bankrupt because of a mark-to-market accounting rule, which is the best practice, is the best practice that is used internationally in accounting terms. They happen to own a lot of mortgage-backed bonds, 
which they have issued, and other mortgages. And a lot of those mortgages went underwater as market conditions deteriorated. And yes, if you marked to market, they were bankrupt. But the nationalization wiped out the shareholders' equity. And a lot of that shareholders' equity was held by small rural and country and community banks who, in order to deal with Jenny May and Fannie Mae, were required to purchase stock. And so they had on their balance sheets what they thought was gold-plated asset. And an organization backed by the full faith and security of the American government. And it had value one day, and the next day its value was zero. And all of a sudden you had a group of sick banks. But people said, we've got to bail out these banks in America. And then you wonder, why did all of that begin to happen? And that's just part of the picture. Now here's where the savings coming from. What we see here is a mapping of the United States savings right into the price of gasoline. As the price of gasoline went up, notice we've got a reverse axis over here on the right-hand side. Here's the price of gasoline, dollar per gallon. That's a dollar and a half up there. That's four fifty here. As the price of gasoline went up, the amount that we folks out there in the household sector could save went down. Price of gasoline went down, our savings went up, and so not only did we have an incentive to increase the amount we're saving because of uncertainty, because of fear, we now had a means to increase our savings. And so savings is beginning to build again in our economy, and we're going to need it. And so, you know, one of our questions is how fast does this thing fall? How deep is the slide? Uh, just to put us in the mood there as we think about this a little bit more. The thing about this collapse that we've had is that it was sudden. And we'll look at some data that will show us just how sudden, how sudden it was. And when something is this sudden, generally speaking in economics, we would assume that there was some exogenous event, something from outside that happened, that shocked this system, that caused something sudden to take place. There's an index that's produced monthly by the Purchasing Managers Association. It is now called the Supply Chain Managers Association, but they still call their index the PMI index. It comes out monthly. It's for the entire United States. This is for manufacturing. The zero point is 50. That is, as long as the number is 50, you're okay. The economy is sort of moving at a normal rate. If the value is above 50, you're expanding. If it's below 50, you're contracting. And so if you look at this last blue bar before we dropped off the edge, and that was August. September is a sheer drop-off. You don't find any kind of drop-off that sheer, that sudden, in the paper. In other words, you walked off the edge of the world. That was followed by another drop-off in October, another one in November, another one in December. So we have a shock to the system. If you want to try to find a date when it happened, it would be long about September 15th. That happens to coincide with the collapse of Lehman Brothers, it happens to coincide with the nationalization of AIG, the world's largest insurance company. So long about middle September, then I've mentioned Jenny May and Fannie Mae, those actions out there in financial markets begin to have reverberations showing up now in the manufacturing economy. Now depending on where you hail from, and we'll see some data as we do, depending on where you hail from, the more manufacturing intensive your state or your district, the harder it is working right now. And this data right here is enabling you to make that kind of forecast. This is just another view of the same data in the northwest corner. Down below is the rest of the economy. That is, we have a manufacturing piece and we have a services piece. The two together make up the economy. Notice that in the lower panel, down in the southwest corner, this is the services economy. Now, it had a drop off too. But notice, seldom is heard an encouraging word, but at least we have one for December. <coughs> now, no one ever wants to look at one data point and announce a trend. But when you're hungry, as hungry for good news as we are in the American economy, there's a piece. Some people are interpreting this to say the services economy has found the bottom. 
and it's beginning to claw its way back while the manufacturing economy is still weak. Now, fortunately, the service economy is the bigger part of our economy. It is also the part that has the highest wages of salaries. So we've got a little bit potentially positive news. And of course, you would expect this in terms of housing starts, but that had been dropping off for a long time. In fact, if we had a longer set of data there, you would see housing start dropping off from 2005 forward. That sector has been slowing down for a long time, but then it gets serious. Now, as the economy has tightened, <clears throat> as fear has taken over, <clears throat> followed by panic, literal panic in financial markets. By panic, I mean that was the day I drove over to Wachovia, one of the banks I use, and checked to see what the FDIC insurance was on our account, something that I hadn't even thought about in years. That's borderline panic. That was the same week I called my broker at Merrill Lynch. You know, I never thought about Merrill Lynch losing money. All of a sudden, I began to think about Merrill Lynch and how much money they had in the till. So I called my broker and I said, Terry, remind me, please, uh, what kind of insurance coverage do I have on my broker's account with you? I just happened to have my grandchildren's college education fund resting there. And I've made a lot of promises, and I plan to deliver on those. That's borderline panic. You begin to see the data in the panic with accounts moving out of banks where there was uncertainty with respect to their credit worthiness. That is, people, I had friends calling me and they said, please tell me, the day you decide to go down to the bank and cash out and put your money in a coffee can in the back room, <laughs> would you please call me? <laughs> because I'm thinking about doing that's panic. So we had panic that developed in the American economy during this period. As the panic developed, the asset base for banks began to go down. In addition to that, there was $500 billion in overconstruction and housing in the United States. That's the estimate. We invested $500 billion too much in housing. That's the default component. That translates into $5 trillion of losses that get communicated to the banking system. For every dollar you and I put into a deposit, they can lend 10. For every dollar they lose, 500 billion, they lose 10. And so here's this sock that comes to the banking system. As that began to happen, the banking regulators said, Look, you guys, you got to tighten up your lending standards. When I call friends who are vice presidents and presidents of banks in my area, and I ask them, what are you doing in terms of your lending policy? And they said, let us tell you what we're not doing. If anybody has the word developer or development in a loan application, they are automatically turned down. And it doesn't matter how creditworthy they have been in the past. There's no lending going on for development. By that, they mean real estate development. And so lending standards tighten. There's a survey taken every month by the Federal Reserve Board, and you can see the results, the percent of the domestic banks tightening their lending standards as they try to husband their resources. And here's the reverse of that, vehicle sales in the United States. Tightening lending standards so that people who previously were credit <coughs> can no longer get a loan or renew the loans that they have. And so we get the tightening, and then here's retail sales. We'll get December data next week. But that's what's happened to the growth, negative growth, of retail sales. And so obviously what we're looking at here is a sick economy. And I, I hope that you and I, we would continue to have these conversations or sometime in the future, we would never see anything that looks this sick as we think about our economy. We've got a bad case. Now, how long has it been going on? Now, this is just a reminder that this sickness has been with us for some time, but then it got shot with the panic. Each month we get data from the Federal Reserve Board called Industrial Production for the United States. That's all of the output of the utilities, the manufacturers, and the mines in America. And this is the 
year-over-year -year annual growth rate, and I'm showing you this to show you that it peaked out back in 2005. Our economy has been sick for almost five years now. It didn't just get sick in September. And we had Lehman Brothers going down the tubes. And so we were already approaching zero growth. Now the reason I'm mentioning this is that if you're going to have a disease, it's awfully nice for one to come when you're healthy. If you're going to get sick, it's awfully good for you to be healthy at the time the sickness comes. What we had was what we had in the economy that was already sick and weak and now being hit by this panic. That gives you a trend line. It's not real hard to make a forecast as to where the economy was going, and this could be made before the problems that had come, going back to last December. Now, how long and how deep will this be? To try to approach this question and to put some dimensions on it, here's what I've done. And this is not to say that, hey, this is science. What it does say, I hope, is that this is a scientific approach to the question. But as a scientific approach to the question, we say, what is the question? What tools do I have available to me? What data do I have command over that would enable me to make a statement about what the future might be? And so what I decided was that I would look at all previous recessions in the United States. And so now I'm showing you about four choices there. These are recessions that we have experienced in the United States. This data goes back to 1980 and comes forward. And every time you see a sag below the line, that's a recession. That's that negative period in our economy. And so I studied these and I said, OK, I'm going to pick one. And I'm going to pretend that that experience is going to be repeated. And so what I decided to do was to pick the worst recession we have had since World War II. I'm going to say this one we've got right now is going to be equal to the worst recession we've had since World War II. And there it is right there. That's the worst one since World War II. I don't know how many of you were in Washington uh, in, the, in 1980, 81, 82, 83. I was. Uh, but that was when Mr. Volcker decided to put his foot on the brakes. He was the chairman of the Fed. He decided to put his foot on the brakes. He started doing that at the end of the Carter administration and then really hit those power brakes hard during the first few years of the Reagan administration. Why was he doing that? To get inflation out of the economy. We had had a prime interest rate at 20% plus, at plus, the highest prime interest rate in our country's history because there was so much inflation in the economy. And so Mr. Volcker says, we're going to squeeze it out. And the American people paid one heck of a price to get rid of inflation. And here's the price. That was a deliberately deliberate recession courtesy of the Federal Reserve Board. And most of the recessions that we're looking at have been deliberately delivered in an attempt to guard us against high inflation. And so, all right, so I took that data and I said, okay, I'm going to pick this data up right in here. I pick that up and I'm going to come over and I'm going to stick it in to the current period. And that's what I've done. So, I started it right in here. Here we go, 2008, August 2008, September. I started right there. There's 1981, September. And so I've stuck it in. I've added it in. And I say, okay, now I'm going to look at that real hard, and that's going to enable me to make a forecast. The forecast, if you see where the data turns up, that happens to be 2010. Now looking at it, it also enables me to make a statement about how deep the recession will be. Again, assuming that it's like the one in 81, 82. So here's the picture that you have. The picture says that unemployment in the United States will rise to 8.8% for the nation. 8.8%. It was at 4.4% back then before the recession hit. And unemployment rose by 4.4 percentage points. And so that says we'll see 8.8. .8. It also tells us when we'll see it. We'll see it in June. 
And so now you begin to put some dimensions. But remember what the assumption is, that this is like the worst recession since World War II. Now recent data, I'm sorry to tell you, causes me to think that what we've got is worse than the worst recession since World War II. That is, we probably have to add a little bit of ugliness uh, to the data. And I think it's going to be on the depth side as opposed to the length side. I think the length will carry us to 2010, but I have fears that it's going to be deeper than the 80, 81, 82 period uh, would tell us. What about labor market effects? Uh, I'm showing you total employment in the United States with a trend line running through it. Here's the last observation. I punched that in at the tablet end last night. That's for December. As you look at that December observation, notice that there's a pretty good sized gap between it and the November operation, November informant. So we're still getting that sheer drop off. That's part of the pessimism generator that I mentioned when I said I'm thinking that what we are in is going to be worse than the 80, 81, 82 period. Now people say, well, isn't there something we can do about it? And the answer is, if we haven't already done it, it's not going to happen this year. Those cookies are already in the oven. The cookies for this economy for 2009 are already in the oven baking. It's hard to think of anything anybody can do, and I'm speaking of politically feasible things, that would cause a sudden shift and jerk in the economy before this calendar year is over. I expect we can see some results near the end of this calendar year. But by and large, those cookies have already been made. They didn't put any chocolate chips in there. I'm not sure those cookies are going to be real good. But they are in there, and there's a trillion dollars, several trillion dollars that went into the recipe. It's already in there baking as we think about this economy this year. But the guys who keep up with recessions are saying, uh, here's where it started. That's December of 2007. Here's December for 2008. It gives you a picture of what has happened to total employment. Here's another picture. What we're looking at here is quarterly, the quarterly, the average growth in employment in the United States across quarters. The average across quarters. Here's the last quarter of 2008. Now, if that's not a sheer drop-off, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. And by and large, I think that was delivered by panic, not by real economic forces, but by real psychological forces. That we got the panic. The prospects are that this quarter that we're in right now will look a lot like that. And then we start coming back. This is a measure of diffusion, diffusion with respect to employment gains in the national economy. When we are at 50, as many industries and sectors are expanding as are contracting in terms of employment growth. That's sort of a neutral point. Below that, the recession is getting deeper. It is affecting more and more sectors as this line drops. Here's a note of optimism. That slope turned up. Isn't it funny that you would begin to get excited about the second derivative of a function? That is, hey, it's still <laughs> negative, it's going down, but you say, yeah, but it's not going down as fast. <laughs> That's gotten to be good news. Jobless claims, where are they in the United States across regions? You can see that the South is the hardest hit. Down there where people talk funny the way I do. Um, and you can see the Midwest, and here's the Northeast. Now, it so happens that if you were looking at the services economy, it would be the inverse of that. The Northeast is the heavier services economy. The South is the lesser services economy. It's a manufacturing economy, by and large. And so wherever you have the heavier manufacturing, then you've got the greater jobless claim. We look at these outline maps when you and I get together, and this one is for March of 2008. 
The darker those colors, the higher the unemployment rate. And now what we're looking at is how this slowdown, this panic, this recession generates its footprint across the United States and how suddenly it does so. The northwest corner is for August. Notice how many states went into recession between March and August. Now that's still before the panic takes place. The northeast corner is for September. That's the month when the panic takes place. And the bottom one, this is the most recent data, this is for November. What's left that is not in serious trouble with recession it's primarily energy producing states, whether it be ethanol or whether it be coal from western producers like Wyoming and Montana, or whether it be natural gas or oil. But it is primarily the energy specialized states that still have a relatively low unemployment rate. Manufacturing is hurting. That's the purple is the worst color. Those are your manufacturing states. <coughs> And over here are the more seriously affected states by what started it all, the subprime problem. California, Arizona, Nevada. States in recession, this is based on data for industrial production and employment. There really isn't a technically accepted definition of a state recession, but somebody made one up. And here's what it looks like. This is August. There it is for September. There it is for October, the most recent data. And once again, you have these states that aren't in recession, but they are now labeled at risk. Again, it's those energy states as we move on. Now let's talk about money. Uh, that's what's coming out of the 55-gallon drum over there. Uh, and, and we're spilling a lot of it, aren't we? In order for money coming out of, coming into our economy, that is when the Fed, the Treasury, those have been the primary actors, when the Fed and the Treasury invent new programs, as they have, they have about, been about as creative as it's possible to imagine, and as they have expanded their lending capabilities, you start off with an organization called the Federal Reserve Board. It's organized in 1916 for the purpose of maintaining the integrity of the banking system. And so there it is, our central bank. As a result of the crisis and the panic, the Federal Reserve Board has expanded its powers in an attempt to overcome these serious negative forces. They're now lending to anybody who becomes a bank. GMAC became a bank. All right. uh, Massachusetts Insurance became a bank. That opened the door to them. And so now we have a number of major firms that have baptized themselves banks. They have done the appropriate things to become banks, which give them access to the Federal Reserve lending windows. In addition to that, the Federal Reserve has said, we will go in and provide a market for commercial paper, because the commercial paper market was dead, dying. It was functioning, but not real well. What is commercial paper? That's where corporations, business firms, go out and they are lending, they're selling merchandise, they're producing stuff on credit, and they go out and borrow against that paper. That's the commercial paper market. It's short term <coughs> lending, but it's the lifeblood of most businesses, and that market had gotten crippled. So the Federal Reserve said, we will make a market for commercial paper. So now the Federal Reserve is out lending there. In order to do something about home building, mortgages, home lending, the Federal Reserve said, we will go out and we'll start buying mortgage-backed securities for our portfolio. Jenny Mays, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac's. And then, finally, uh, in their effort, they did something that has not been done, in, I would say, systematically. Anytime you say something hasn't been done, somebody's going to say, oh, you know, I know a case hasn't been some done systematically since World War II, and that is an accord between Treasury and the Fed. Cooperation between the Treasury and the Fed so that it's possible, in effect, for the Fed to print more money. It's the 
develop a lending mechanism as between those two organizations. We had that accord during World War II in order to facilitate the sale of war bonds. To keep the cost of borrowing money for the war at a lower level. It is called the accord in monetary history. So now we have an accord. With all of that going on, we still were not breaking through in terms of this chart and still until right here. What I'm showing you here is growth of money in the economy. This is the non-bank economy. This is you and me. In other words, the Fed can do all kinds of things. The Treasury can do all kinds of things to announce the opening of windows, the new programs, so on and so forth. But if the banks do not lend to you and me, you don't get money into the economy. We've already seen how the banks raise their lending standards. And we've already seen how a typical consumers sitting at the kitchen table said, is this a time to go into debt? No. But finally, we are getting money coming into the economy again. That's that spike that is showing up. M1 is demand deposits and hand-to-hand -hand currency, what you and I have in our pockets for our entire economy. Now, during this period right in here, the Fed was doing everything they could to keep us from borrowing. That was trying to offset this period back here where the Fed did everything it could to get us to borrow. To pump money into the economy, some people attribute that as one of the causal effects of the subprime problem. The Fed made an awful lot of money available back there in 2002, 3, 4. Then they put their foot on the brakes. It's really on the brakes. And now it's on the gas. And we're getting money in the economy. That's a positive sign for an economy that is asleep, is that it's waking up. And now we've got monetary forces play. The scary side of that coin, along with the other problems that I have mentioned that the Fed and the Treasury have developed, the scary part of the problem might be thought of in this, in this way, in this analysis way. Suppose you're out on a camping trip. I'm thinking of a beautiful mountain out there in Montana where I've spent some time. Suppose we put up our tents and we're out there on the side of that mountain. We've been looking at those beautiful wildflowers for about an hour or two. And we come back to our camp. We have started a fire. But the blame thing is about to go out. And you get down on your knees and you start blowing the coals and say, hey, go get some sticks, some straw or something. I think we can get this thing going again. That's our economy. So you're down on your knees and you're blowing and, hey, I think I'll back to get a plane. And then someone says, hey, I think I'll go and siphon some gasoline out of the truck and bring it over. So said, well, be careful with that stuff. This plane thing could blow up. Well, I'll put it over here in a can by the fire. And so now you're blowing the coals and this person has this 55, uh, has a five-gallon can of gasoline and they take the cap off. That's explosive inflation. And so to get the fire going, we're doing this. The other things that we are doing, the increases in liquidity that is being provided through the Treasury and the Fed, the analogy, that's the gasoline in the can. The temptation, of course, particularly if you're getting cold on the side of that mountain, what's the temptation? <laughs> well, let's just put a little gasoline in the fire. <laughs> Let's just put a little gas. So the temptation is there. And then somebody says, I think I'll go cycle some gasoline out of my car and put it over here on the other side and over here. That's sort of what we have right now. High risk of inflation in a deflationary economy. The economy is experiencing deflation. We're down on our knees blowing the coals, trying to get it to go again, which would reflate the economy. But we've got the gasoline on the sidewalk which might lead to an explosion. <clears throat> now this is just another indication. Here's the world bouncing along. This is called LIBOR. That's the London Interbank Offer Rate. If you borrow money, maybe some of you have borrowed money recently, and your loan may be tied to the LIBOR rate. That's a world interest rate. It's a rate that banks charge each other when they borrow over short-term periods, it runs through the London market. 
Now here's the LIBOR rate. Just bouncing along, bouncing along, bouncing along. Wow, here's September. Woo! That's the credit market locked up. And that's another way of saying, you say credit market's locked up, what do you mean by that? That's what we mean. The LIBOR rate went so high that banks stopped borrowing from each other. And so the financial markets, in a sense, went to sleep. Notice, it has come down. That's the encouraging sign. I mentioned it at the very beginning of, of the conversation. So, as we look at these things, a few things, and a couple of other things I wanted to mention and then stop and listen. It still pays to have a bachelor's degree. I punched this data in this morning. This is for December. The unemployment rate in America with people with a bachelor's degree or more is 3.7%. 3.7%. And as is always the case, the people in our country who are bearing the burden of unemployment are the people with less education. Less than a high school diploma, it's almost 11%. And so as you look at your own states, your own districts, your own neighborhood, you can pretty well map the seriousness of the economic problem in terms of unemployment by looking at educational attainment data of the population. One last item of really good news. For many, many years now, I have been tracking the price of oil, crude oil, in terms of gold. In other words, the idea is that Arab oil traders demand payment in gold. They don't want dollars, they don't want euros, they want gold. When you look at it that way, inflation is taken out of the picture. Over a long, long period of time, over many decades, the price of crude oil has cycled around that dark line where an ounce of gold would buy 20 barrels of oil. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, it cycles. We've been below that line since about 2000. <coughs> Invasions, wars, mad people, and so forth have contributed to prices that have been very, very dear. Lambo, the price of crude oil is now back where it typically has been over many, many decades. Those disturbances have hit another disturbance, and that is the recession. I want to stop now and, and uh, see if you have questions. I uh, have some other things that I might mention, but <coughs> questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I wanted to just go back to your, uh, me. I want to go back to your charts that you had where you were kind of superimposing and you took previous uh, yeah. seconds. And uh, here's the thing I'm curious about. I'm, I'm old enough to have actually been working on the hill when Volcker uh, okay. was the race. All right, you remember that thing for period. And, you know, we were basically following, you know, an expansionary Fed policy and inflation. Um, what I'm curious about is what do you think the possibility is that it might be quite different and more like the Japanese experience in the 90s because you've got, you've got this debt uh, uh, deflation and deflationary pressure, which could have a very, very different picture. I, I just want to say before everybody leaves, uh, if you could fill out those yellow forms and also give you one Yeah, oh good. Thank you very much. Uh, the, uh, uh, first off, let's say the causal forces of what we have right now and what we had then are very different. But the effect of the causal forces is similar. That is, when the Fed puts its foot on the brake and tightens credit, credit is no longer available in the economy, and the economy begins to stumble. And so that's the effect of the Volcker clan thing. But there's far more to our story right now than to that. Back to your point. What we are trying to do as human beings, what we want to do is to avoid pain. We don't want anybody to hurt. That's what we would like. Don't want anybody to hurt. There are $500 billion invested in houses, too many of them, but we don't want anybody to hurt the cost of that. And so we understand how to If we postpone the pain that goes 
with those houses and the defaults and the bad mortgages and the bankruptcies, then we will postpone the slowdown. That is what Japan did. That is what they have done. They refused to write down the bad loans in their banking system. They said, let's just put it off. Let's just put it off. Let's let time take care of it. We're in a mood to say, let's try to do something for those families who are defaulting on their mortgages so they can stay in the house. <coughs> Under U.S. law, they won't have to make the house payment for two years. You've got a house rent free. And so that means that you are doing something for those people. But the problem is being postponed. And so to some extent, how much we are willing to bear the pain that goes with this recession so that we can get rid of the illness that we have had speaks to how rapidly we will go through it. Now, the, uh, I know that your time is precious and there are all kinds of appointments, but I wanted to get to the very last part and then I'll take some more questions for anybody who has the time to engage in them. When we were together in October, uh, we posited some scenarios, man alive, there's some bad ones, and I had a few people who said, i got to fill in the blank on this thing. But we had three choices. This was back in October. As to what was going to happen in the economy, and 23 people who were in this room picked number one, with bailouts to the rescue, credit markets finally opened up, but not in time to avoid recessionary forces. Unemployment will rise to 7% by December. Wow, that was pretty good. It did. Industrial production runs south. Yes, it did. GDP growth approaches zero. Better than that, it went negative. But here's the bad part of that one. The Dow Jones says, hey, better things are coming. It's at 12,000. Oh, do I wish that were the case. And my grandchildren do too. All right. Then we had a, a second choice. Notice we had the price of oil going to 150. Dow, 6 to 9,000. That's right. Wolf and banks. 14 people picked that. And then two people take the last one. Here are the choices that I put before you today, and I would appreciate it very much for those of you who have time to uh, take a look at those. Pick one, give us an indication, and uh, then we will keep this conversation going. Now, while you're doing that, other questions that you might have, and maybe I didn't deal with the one you raised uh, to no, your satisfaction. No, so you, follow up. That's a, that's a very Good explanation. I think one of the reasons why I'm curious about it uh, is because uh, one, one of the reasons why I think the Japanese experience is, is relevant is because the efforts to spin their way out of it, uh, a lot of it uh, dealing with building roads to nowhere, anyone that's been to Japan has seen that they have roads that go out in the middle of nowhere. And, and economists have looked back on it and they've said it was like pushing against the string. That's right. Right. And, and, and so if it is more like Japan, what does that tell us about the prospect of these large right. expenditures that we're about to do? Right. Let's, go, let's keep in mind this, what we think to be the source of the problem. Mm -hmm. We think the source of the problem is $500 billion excess construction of houses in the United States, and let's call that the subprime problem. That's the source. Nothing we have done yet directly speaks to the housing component of the problem. <coughs> Everything we have done so far is indirectly reaching to the economy. Let's try to help banks that are weak financially. Let's try to help the auto industry. Let's do this, let's do that, let's target this. Nothing that speaks directly to the housing thing. In what I have read, I have not seen the details on Mr. Obama's plan. I don't think any, somebody has, but I don't think it's been completely unveiled. But among the elements that I noticed in the plan is one that would give a tax credit to individuals who buy a house. That speaks directly to the problem. In other words, if we had a $10,000 tax credit, that is you knock off $10,000 on your income taxes, if you go out and buy a house, then that would speed up the absorption of this excess supply of houses in the market. So that speaks directly to it. Now, back when all this stuff was just getting started, someone, it was sort of like Swift, uh, Thomas Swift, you might remember him from English literature in the Irish, right? They said what we need to do is get the government to buy the houses and bulldoze them. 
Now that would probably be a cheap solution. That would probably be a cheaper solution than the one we're using. Just go out and buy any house that's for sale and get a bulldozer and push it over. Got too many? That's not the problem. We know that we'll never do that, and I'm not suggesting that we should. But up until now, we've done nothing that directly speaks to the housing surplus problem. And that's the first thing I've seen uh, in the various plans. Now, as you think about, uh, let's call it stimuli type programs, uh, let me ask you, as you think about different ideas that are presented, to go back to the savings that we have in the economy, that we got $50 billion a year in recent years to pay for this thing. And so when somebody says, we need a trillion dollars, divide that by $50 billion, and so you can say, do you realize how many years it's going to take if we took all of our savings to pay off this program? That's not the entire story, but it's a way to get to the story. When you pose it that way, the next question is, well, let's think of the benefits and costs. When people build highways to somewhere, or when people rebuild bridges that are crumbled, in a normal situation, in a household or a business, you don't write that expenditure off in one year. You amortize it. And so you say, yes, it'll take 20 years for us to pay the cost of rebuilding bridges and highways. That's a benefit cost analysis. Then you look at things that have that introduce an incentive so that we would get more income and more savings. Uh, one of Mr. Obama's proposals is to make it possible for people who are currently unemployed and on welfare not to pay such a high tax when they get employed. That is, you give up all of your welfare if you take a job. So there's a very high tax to going to work. Milton Friedman made this proposal decades ago. It was called the negative income tax. All right, you get that in there. That gives an incentive for people to go to work. That increases the size of the pie. If you reduce taxes, it does two things. It takes a burden off of existing taxpayers, but it also gives more people an incentive to work more. So as you evaluate pieces of the proposal, there will be some pieces that you will say, that's just pure pork and it's bailout, and that's the way we do politics in America. But it's useful, I think, to label things as to whether they are just damage control versus building capital for the future, and therefore logically would carry a longer time payout. I saw a hand that went over here yesterday. Along the same lines, I was wondering what the uh, tax credit idea to help uh, the excess housing. Did yeah. it also artificially decrease uh, home values? I think it would increase home values. That is, there would be an additional buyer who would come into the real estate market and say, I've been driving back and forth to work every day, and this house has a sale sign on it. If I could get it at a low enough price, I would buy it and rent it to somebody. And now I'm going to get $10,000 knocked off my income tax if I buy that house. So there may be, I would say, there's an additional buyer brought in to the market. Otherwise, the prices have to continue to fall. Right now, they have fallen, on average, 19% in the United States. And so that's a number that cuts across the entire United States in terms of the average price of homes sold. They've fallen 19 The indication is they need to fall 30% for this thing to equilibrate again. And so already it's working slowly. There are a lot of families who, who are celebrating, saying we always wanted that house of our dreams, and they finally got the price down so that we can buy it. And then you have people who are caught in that terrible bind who are declaring bankruptcy because they can't pay for the house they're in. But that's part of the torturous and joyful process that, that we have to on another hand. Yes, sir. Uh, if there were a risk, given the rapid inflation of money supply, some, it's, the op it's the opposite in effect of the policy 81, 82, isn't it? Because it appears you're not going to get these marginal tax cuts on, on income and capital gains. If anything, you'll get increases, and yet you're going to have a rapid expansion of the money supply. So the, isn't there a risk of, of, of stagflation, of uh, inflation, and low growth? Yes. Yes. <coughs> Keep 
keep in mind, you're absolutely right. And those are the cans of gasoline sitting around the fire. And we, there's a lot. There is a huge amount that has been added. Uh, for the first time since I have been following this, this economy, the Federal Reserve has done two things. They, as I've indicated, they have expanded their tools. And part of that expansion has to do with providing liquidity, doing everything they can, call that gasoline, trying to provide liquidity. The traditional tool is managing the money supply, and they're working that tool as well. Back to your question. What Mr. Volcker was doing was trying to get rid of the inflation that a previous generation had built into the economy. What we have going on has the very high risk, as you point out, of installing inflation that would be larger than what Mr. Volcker tried to get rid of. Now, our, if, you, if you wanted to make a forecast, my forecast would be, and that's what we will do. That's a forecast. It certainly is what we should do, but that's the way our economy, our political economy, has operated in the past. Now, the forecast that I'm giving you that says 2010, that's a very short-term forecast. Money supply effects generally take 9 to 10 months to show up in the economy. There's a lag. We're talking about pushing on the string. When banks have additional reserves provided to them, or when we taxpayers take over ownership of commercial banks and now they have more capital, a line does not immediately form at the lending window. It takes time. That's part of the lag, which is usually nine months. Incidentally, in terms of the capital, the equity capital of all the banks in America, right now you and I own 20% of the equity capital of all U.S. banks. And so, as you think about this future economy, I started off by saying, as you think about the powerful policy decisions that have already been made, we are building an economic world for the next generation that is unlike anything that has ever existed in this country. That is, we have nationalized 20% of the banks. And then you ask, how do you unwind that? Those are questions that we're not able to address at this point, but they will be questions that may be addressed when things get better in 2010. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, but I cut the federal funds rate. Yes, sir. It's normal tool for fighting inflation, stimulating the economy. Yes. But cutting it so much, so many times, and so extensively, has the Fed run a risk of wearing the tool out by reducing it to zero and not having it there any longer? That tool, I would say that tool is used up. That, I would say that tool is used up, but the Fed has other bullets, uh, uh, big ones, that they can use. But uh, what we were speaking of here is when the Fed Open Market Committee meets and makes a decision, what are we going to do about credit conditions in America? And if they say, one of the things we have control over is Buying and selling securities that will affect the overnight lending rate called the Fed Funds Rate. Well, now, right now, it's at 0.5 or zero. It's as close to zero as it might be. And it can't go negative. That is, they can't say we're going to start paying these to take money. That's not uh, technically feasible. And so, in a sense, that says that that particular instrument has not been used up. But they have others available, too. Yes, sir. Hey, Bruce. Scott, what do you say? Good. Um, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you. Right. We, uh, I, I find, I've got some friends who manage hedge funds and hedge funds. Um, but world, worldwide, during this panic, everyone went in treasuries. In order to buy treasuries, you had to buy dollars. The dollar scoot, scooted up real quickly, real, real fast, real high. Um, at some point, that's going to unwind. And then when the risk appetite increases globally, where people say, you know what, the U.S. isn't as good a place for our money as we thought. How, how are you thinking about that? What's the signal that will give you a sense that that's, that point has come? I don't know about signals, but let me just offer this uh, as we engage in this conversation. That is one of the thoughts that come to mind. Everything is always relative. That is, when you say the United States economy is the world's safe haven for investment, you can invest in America and your property rights will be protected pretty well here relative to other places. 
And so that says as long as we are better than the best, then, then this is the safe thing. We look at the macro policies and the monetary policies that have been adopted by every other industrialized country. While we've been doing ours, they've been doing theirs. And it's awfully hard, it is for me, uh, to gather enough data so that I can make a statement as to whether we've done our economy worse than they've done theirs, which gets back to the point. That is, our currency can continue to be attractive relative to other currencies, depending on what they have done. And so while we have nationalized 20% of our banks, it's heavier than that in the United Kingdom, for example. And while we have pending activity and actions already taken with respect to General Motors and Chrysler and maybe Ford will come around, the same kinds of things have already taken place in Canada and in France and in the United Kingdom and in Germany. In other words, it's hard to just answer the question. It will be one that can, I would say, can only be sorted out out there in that marketplace. So I would suggest you look at the futures market and see what those people are saying with respect to currencies. But back to you, one thing that you mentioned, when that dollar got stronger, isn't it rather interesting, the price of gasoline at the pump started going down. Those strong dollars could buy more oil, which makes the cheap gasoline. And so sometimes when we are looking at the price of gasoline shooting up and down, and you say, well, what in the world's going on? One of the things that is going on is either a stronger dollar or a weaker dollar because we are importing most of that stuff. Yes, sir. One of the implications from your talk today is that recessions recur. Uh, is this recession, uh, based on what we know thus far, stronger, <coughs> deeper, a worse event due to, among other things, globalization, and does that mean that because we are more closely tied to other countries all across, across the globe, that it's going to be more difficult for us to get out of this because everybody is tied to it? It certainly, I, I would say, what we are experiencing certainly relates to the connectedness of human economic communities worldwide. Just for the, I would say for the first time in history, an investor in Helsinki could have in his or her portfolio a mortgage from Jones County, Georgia. That's never happened before. That somebody in Helsinki would say, well, let me see what I've got in my portfolio. I don't know where Jones County, Georgia is, and I don't care. Now I'm going to speak to your question. Why don't they care? Because this port these mortgage-backed securities that I bought were AAA rated. Well, what does that mean? There's something called Moody's and Standard & Poor's and Fitch Ratings that puts a rating on all debt that is sold across financial institutions worldwide. So I don't have to think about Jones County, Georgia. I can trust this investment because of those ratings. I think the major problem that has occurred that has given us this global problem is lost trust lost trust. We human beings had invented all kinds of devices to extend trust. AAA ratings were one of them. Well, it turns out that Moody's and Standard and & Poor's and Fitch's were selling their services, as they should, to financial institutions, and they were putting AAA on stuff that turned out not to be AAA at all. And when that happened, now we're back to the investor in Helsinki who says, it said AAA, and now they're defaulting on this thing. What's going on? Now I've got to find out where Jones County, Georgia is. What does that say to me? I'll never invest in anything that says Jones County, Georgia on it, even if it says AAA. And that same investor says, we better take a look at all the rest of the mortgage-backed securities in our portfolio that have come from different places in the world. All of them have AAA on them. Are they AAA or not? That generates the freeze-up in the market. That's when you say, wait a minute, let's hold on. So a piece of it is lost trust. 
Another piece that contributes to the lost trust is mark-to-market -market accounting rules. Something that works real well in some circumstances. But when you have collapsed markets and they're no longer transactions, what does it mean to assign market value to something that is not being bought and sold? And where you say, well, the last transaction was between a bankruptcy party, a bankrupt party, and the federal government. And they assigned a value. And mark the market rules says everybody's got to mark the market. And so now you spread a contagion of bankruptcy. And that begins to erode trust. One of the most marvelous things, I'll end with this because I know your time is precious and, and you're tired of listening to me. One of the most marvelous things that has ever developed among humankind is trust is trust. We do an awful lot. My broker will not accept a written order from me and neither will yours. They only do business on the basis of voice. He trusts my voice. He does not trust a letter. I can't send an email and say sell a thousand shares of stock in my portfolio. He'll send back and say give me a call Bruce. It's based on trust. Give me a we have a huge amount of trust in our face-to-face -face encounters and in our immediate communities, and we've invented all kinds of social institutions to make that work. Truth-telling, promise-keeping, all kinds of things. As we get more distant in this world with strangers, we run out of those social mechanisms and we have invented others. Guarantees, warranties, credit ratings, Dun and Bradstreet ratings, all kinds of things that enable us to extend our markets. And now, as you point out, we have extended markets to the limit of the globe, and some of the devices that human communities were relying on turned out to be faulty, and that's given us this shape. So we have to find ways to restore trust. Thank you for your kind attention. It's been fun being with you. Thank you, Reverend Cronus, and uh, please uh, join us tomorrow for our talk on financial services, where uh, Bobby and will uh, join us once again. Thank you very much, and have a good day. Good to see you, my friend.